This toy car is insanely quick. It's so quick in fact that I think I can beat the zero to 60 time of a Tesla Roadster, making it one of the quickest electric vehicles in the entire world. So in this video, we're gonna answer the question, can a toy really beat a real Tesla? And I should say that this acceleration is only made possible by these two electric jet fans that literally suck the car to the ground, creating an immense amount of downforce. Now, before we find out if it actually can beat the Tesla, let's talk about why it is really hard to do so and why I broke so many parts trying. First off, I have to exceed two Gs of acceleration to come close to the zero to 60 time that I'm going for. And as Newton taught us, this means I need a traction force equal to the car's mass times acceleration, which is about 16 pounds. Then I have to add in wind resistance and rolling resistance, giving me around 20 pounds to overcome. The wheels have a two inch radius, which gives me a max moment of 40 inch pounds. And at 60 miles an hour, they need to rotate at 5,042 revolutions per minute, which is roughly equal to 2,400 watts to the wheels. So obviously I'm gonna need a much more powerful 6S motor setup. And after 3D printing a bunch of brackets, we made that a reality. But all of the power in the world doesn't really matter if you can't get enough traction to properly use it. My wheels would just spin endlessly and I'll never accelerate as fast as I want. And that's because the available tractive force is roughly equivalent to the coefficient of friction times the car's weight plus the available downforce. And that's where the fans come into play. These fans literally suck the car to the ground through the under tray. The tray is 8.25 by 11 inches, which is about 90.75 square inches of area. And the fans themselves can drop the pressure by about six inches of water, which is roughly equal to 0.21 PSI. And if we take the 90.75 square inches times the 0.21 PSI, we get 19 pounds of downforce. That is 2.4 times the weight of the car, which in racing terms is massive. I also played around with different traction compounds to make sure that my coefficient of friction was as high as possible. And I should also point out that you can only take advantage of the weight over the driven wheels in terms of traction force, which is why I switched from my original two wheel drive fan car to this new four wheel drive chassis that gives me a lot more available tractive force. If I assume my friction coefficient is only 0.8, that means we have a tractive force of 0.8 times eight plus 19 pounds, which equals 21.6 pounds. That should give us enough traction to provide just over two and a half Gs. And let's see if we're even close to being correct. We'll start out with a warm up run that doesn't use any fans, and then we'll go straight to some hard launches. <laughs> It turns out I destroyed the slipper clutch right off the bat, which is ironically only there to prevent me from damaging the drive line with too much torque. But in this case, it literally sheared the metal lugs off the slipper, so it couldn't really engage at all. I did have a strong idea that this may break though, so I had a slipper clutch eliminator handy, and we went ahead and installed that so we could get back to running. And at this point, since I already had it apart and knew I was just gonna break the next weakest length, I also went ahead and rebuilt the differentials with much stronger components and replaced the rear axles with some heavy duty steel axles in hopes that I wouldn't break those as well. And finally, despite leaf blowing the track, that's right, I went through the effort to leaf blow the track, I shattered the lens on my GoPro. So I also designed and 3D printed some nozzle extensions on the fans to try and redirect some of the rocks that the fans throw out away from my camera. And you can see it kind of worked. In the left here, I have no nozzle extension and on the right, I have the nozzle extension. And you can see how much bigger the cloud is on the left fan than it is on the right. And now that we've got it rebuilt, let's go see what breaks next.
This test is exactly what I had hoped to see. I can consistently exceed two Gs, and in my best run, I hit three Gs of acceleration. I eventually destroyed the spur gear, which meant I was gonna call it a day. And while reviewing the data, I noticed that I really didn't consistently hit 60 miles an hour, which meant I needed a re-gear to give myself a little bit more top end. After a quick swap, we were back out of the track. This time we went to a different track, which really wasn't too smooth, but I still saw some very promising times. However, I noticed that the car kind of stutters off the line, which was reflected in both the accelerometer and GPS data. My suspicion was that it is something known as the punch setting, which controls how hard the car launches. So we cranked that up and sent it. Of course, this means I snapped the front drive shaft, but something wonderful happened. Now remember, we're trying to beat a 1.9 second zero to 60 of the Tesla. And I saw that my fastest run on this time was just over two seconds to 58 miles an hour. We are incredibly close. But I also noticed that I still don't have the peak power quite where I want it. So consistently hitting 60 miles an hour is gonna be a little bit of a challenge with this much downforce. To get back to running, I had to make a trip to the Traxxas store for some extreme heavy duty front drive shafts. That is seriously what Traxxas calls them. We swapped those out and it seemed like a good time to start playing with motor timing settings to get a harder launch and just really dominate the Tesla. And because my next runs were in a much larger area, I could run some cornering tests. And in this example, I'm showing that I can consistently hit two Gs while cornering and even three Gs intermittently. Imagine the advantage this would give you on a racetrack where you can literally hit like two or three Gs even in a low speed turn. When I run with the fans off, you can see that I'm lucky to maintain just one G. But let's get back to beating Tesla. Once again, I'm stuttering off the line but it looks like the rest of the run is actually going really good. And after reviewing the data, we have hit a zero to 60 time of 1.825 seconds. That's right, we officially beat the Tesla. And now is a good time to talk about the Tesla time as a matter of fact, because you see what Tesla does is they subtract a one foot rollout, just like Motor Trend and a lot of other auto review magazines. That means they don't actually start the clock until the car has already moved a foot, which in a lot of cases measures something like five to 60 miles per hour instead of zero to 60. So if we go ahead and adjust our data for a one foot rollout, I get a 1.64 seconds versus the 1.9 seconds of the Tesla, which is even more impressive. Seriously, watch how fast this car leaves us behind. That's still not enough for me though, because I feel like if I can just fix the stuttering, this car has so much more in it. My hypothesis now is that it's the side skirts dragging on the ground, creating a ton of friction, making it hard for the motor to kick off initially. So I've added these bearings to the skirts and hope still reduce friction if the skirt does hit the ground. So let's go test. And of course that didn't do it all what I hoped because the bearings over the uneven concrete make the car really unstable over even the smallest seams or bumps. So instead of trying to get a good time, I'm gonna show you what it looks like when we run with the fans off. You can see there is a ton of wheel spin at launch and if we look at the graphs, we barely ever exceed one G of acceleration, which means we would never hit the zero to 60 time we're going for with the fans off. For my final day of testing, we are gonna change motor settings one last time, and we're gonna re-gear again to push the power band even a little bit further out, 
hopefully squeezing out a few more tenths of a second to get our time down even more. I also had this brilliant idea to connect the fans to the throttle so that they're activated when I go full throttle and launch instead of using a servo tester that means I'm draining more battery than I want to. <laughs> well, that was bad because it turns out the fans actually can't spool up fast enough to prevent me from doing a standing wheelie at full throttle. Luckily, the car and camera were fine, so we were able to go back to the original setup and do two more runs. This time we drop to a true 1.73 second zero to 60, and if we subtract the rollout, we get a phenomenal 1.46 second zero to 60. This is half a second faster than the fastest Tesla, which is massive. And I know with more testing and tuning, I can even beat this time, because on other runs, I had even worse launches, but much better average acceleration after you get past that first stuttering phase. I do think a sub 1.4 second zero to 60 is very realistic with this car, but I'll save that for another day. If we dive a little bit deeper into the design details of this car, we see that the fan and electronics architecture is actually pretty much identical to my prior example where I had two 50 millimeter EDF fans driven by their own independent ESCs. And those were controlled by a servo tester, so it was as simple as turning a knob to give myself the specific downforce setting I wanted for the entirety of the run. However, I did move the fans to the middle of the car instead of the rear for two key reasons. The first is weight distribution. This allows me to really center the weight of the car and also reduces my rotational inertia. The second reason was to keep the frontal area as low as possible because I wanted to reduce drag to help my zero to 60 time as much as possible. And because of that, I do wish I would have ran a zero to 60 without the GoPro because it would have just given me a little bit more and hopefully shaved off a 10th or so. We'll do that in the future. The chassis itself was a slash four wheel drive chassis versus the previous two wheel drive chassis for the obvious reason of having all wheels driven, meaning we take advantage of all of the tractive force. It also is a mid motor chassis, which means I have further improved my weight distribution over the legacy two wheel drive chassis, which has the motor in the rear. All the metal parts were plasma cut again, just like the last build. And I reduced the under tray area actually to limit the downforce to what I could reasonably use. Because I do have enough downforce in this setup to not be traction limited at all. I'm actually power and torque limited by the electric motor battery ESC combo I have. So really to get more improvement, I would probably have to either change the uh, motor or maybe even improve the C rating of the battery. One of those two things at a minimum would be required to really get my time down that much further. And to talk about why the front wing looks so incredibly stupid, it's only there to protect the front shocks and A arms. So it has nothing to do with downforce. It's just a protective thing because I am really good at crashing RC cars. Also, builds like this can be a huge challenge, so if you like content like this, please consider subscribing because it does help the channel out a ton.